Good morning. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm grateful that you're here this morning with me. We're in the middle of a series that we call You Asked For It, when each Sunday we've been answering what you might call frequently asked questions submitted from you all. And this morning I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, If you didn't know or haven't heard, a few weeks ago we announced the sad news that I'm currently walking down a painful road of marital breakdown and divorce. Since we announced it a couple of weeks ago, some of the frequently asked questions that you've been asking me have been questions like, are you okay? How are your kids? How can I pray? What do you need? And I'm so grateful. The kids are processing it as far as we can tell in a healthy and appropriate way. Both Bethany and I are committed to doing everything we can to keep their lives as stable and predictable as possible. We spend equal time with them. I'm still in the house. Bethany's close by. They're comfortable in both spaces. Uh, The expectation is that they'll stay at their same schools and that their lives will um, be able to have as little disruption as possible. So thank you for caring for them and for praying for them. And thank you for caring and praying for me. I have so appreciated cards and notes and texts and emails, and I appreciate them even if I haven't responded to them, which I probably won't. (laughs) I'm grateful for the ways that there have been people walking with me. George Patty, who preached last Sunday, has been a particular companion in this journey, and there have been friends inside and outside the congregation who have been really supportive during this painful experience, which has been painful. It's been pretty overwhelming. In fact, typically, when you're preaching, it's not best practice to talk about something that you're currently going through. (laughs) It's really best to wait until you have some distance and perspective that's available to you At times, during this season, I felt like I've been able to more deeply connect with the ministry and with sermons that I've preached in a way that I maybe wouldn't have been able to connect outside of this season at other times and with other topics. I've been really thankful to be a part of a team so that someone else can take a particular Sunday. But it would just feel weird Um, for me to ask or answer other kinds of questions this morning to talk about anything else. So what that means is that what I'd like to share this morning is a little bit about where I am right now, and that's, that's all it is, where I am right now, and I'm in the middle of it. So there's perspective I don't have, Um, I don't have any final declarations or tidy conclusions to offer you. It's just where I am. But I think I have learned some things, and I've sensed God in some surprising ways that might be worth sharing. So instead of answering frequently asked questions from you, I'll maybe share with you some questions I've been frequently asking myself. So let's pray. God, with the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the first question I've been asking myself a lot is the question, why? A natural question to emerge in a time of struggle or crisis, and I've found that there's a lot Lots of versions of this question. What did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? Whose fault is this? What do I need to own? What is not mine to carry? 
What if I had responded this way rather than that way? What if I had prayed more or prayed better or prayed differently? These questions and the many versions of them are all the more haunting when there isn't just one easy answer to the question why. There are lots of things in life, and relationships are one of them, that aren't like cars or something where the light goes on on the dashboard and you know what needs to be fixed and you go to the mechanic and you pay the money and you get the part installed and the problem is fixed. Which is not to say that we hadn't sought and worked with professional expertise. We didn't try to solve it all on our own. It's just to say that our resources haven't been enough. And I'm not used to that, to be honest. I'm used to figuring things out. And that's part of what's been so disorienting and confusing is that I've often felt like I should, we should be able to figure this out. There was one point in the process where I realized also that I was carrying some sort of unexpected and surprising burdens kind of under the waterline. I realized that my, my family, on both my mom and my dad's side, there have been no divorces in my lifetime, which is unusual. Uh, all of those marriages are intact. It's unusual. It's maybe even a, a gift in a way. But I realized that it created in me an expectation about what was normal and what I should expect in life that actually became a, a burden that was disorienting when I, when I was facing a future that looked different. I never considered this to be a possibility for my future. And of course, I'm the only one in my family that is a pastor. So it was easy to ask, what did they know that I don't? What did they do that I didn't? What's wrong with me? Not only that, but I've also grown up since I was 12 years old in churches which rightly advocated and encouraged for healthy and strong marriages, and that's a good thing, but it's also added a similar challenge. Because what do I do with the biblical texts that I read, the ones like in Malachi 2, which can be translated as saying that God hates divorce? Or when I read Jesus affirming that God's intention is for lifelong commitment. Well, I still believe the teaching of the Bible on divorce. In fact, I might believe it now more strongly than I ever have. The Lord hates divorce, and I hate it too. But I've realized that these two good things my family of origin, the faith communities that have shaped my journey, have also, in me, not by any fault of them, but have had created in me basically this unconscious assumption that this is how it should go. That this is what happens if you're a normal person and a good person and you do the things you're supposed to do. This kind of thing shouldn't happen. And when that's your default, as it was for me, and you find yourself facing this kind of thing, it's a struggle. It's easy to feel not normal, but abnormal, not like a good person, but wondering what kind of a bad person you are. It's like there's really something wrong. So there's one person who's really helped me process this experience, uh, among others. This one in particular, I've never actually met. Her name is Kate Bowler. She's a professor and an author. She was 35 years old, and she was living the dream. She had just gotten her PhD published. Her research had been on what is called the prosperity gospel, this phenomenon in American religion, the kind of Christianity you tend to hear from televangelists, which basically teaches that if you do the right things, if you think the right thoughts, if you follow the right rules, if you do good things, 
then God's blessings will inevitably come your way. Which eventually turns out to be fairly ill-equipped to deal with suffering. But Kate had just gotten a prestigious first job teaching at Duke. She had given birth to her first son after years of infertility. Things were perfect. She was blessed. And then she gets a phone call telling her that she had stage four cancer and needed to come immediately to the hospital. And in that moment, she describes that she realized that she had been acting like she was just a sort of academic observer of this phenomenon called the prosperity gospel. But that when she got this call, she realized that she also was following a kind of sophisticated, submerged version of it. She can tell it better than I can, so let's listen to what she has to say. But despite telling myself, I'm just studying this stuff, I'm nothing like them, when I got my diagnosis, I suddenly understood how deeply invested I was in my own Horatio Alger theology. If you live in this culture, whether you are religious or not, it is extremely difficult to avoid falling into the trap of believing that virtue and success go hand in hand. The more I stared down my diagnosis, the more I recognized that I had my own quiet version of the idea that good things happen to good people. Aren't I good? Aren't I special somehow? I have committed zero homicides to date. <laughs> so why is this happening to me? I wanted God to make me good and to reward my faith with just a few shining awards along the way. Okay, like a lot of shining awards. <laughs> I believed that hardships were only detours on what I was certain would be my long, long life. As is the case with many of us, it's a mindset that served me well. The gospel of success drove me to achieve, to dream big, to abandon fear. It was a mindset that served me well until it didn't until I was confronted with something I couldn't manage my way out of, until I found myself saying into the phone, but I have a son, because it was all I could think of to say. That was the most difficult moment to accept. The phone call, the walk to the hospital, when I realized that my own personal prosperity gospel had failed me. Anything I thought was good or special about me could not save me. My hard work, my personality, my humor, my perspective. I had to face the fact that my life is built with paper walls, and so is everyone else's. So, my struggle is not hers, right? I'm not dealing with cancer. I bear responsibility that she does not. I bear a responsibility in the breakdown of my marriage in a way that a person with an illness does not. But her writing and her speaking has helped me see the ways that I have also a personal prosperity gospel that has failed me as well. Help me realize that though I have be been believing in my head genuinely and honestly about a gospel of grace and forgiveness and trying to communicate about a God of an unconditional love and mercy, what I am realizing is that deeper down in the core of my heart, the seat of my emotional life, I have believed, and maybe you do too, that somehow it's up to me to get it right. And I have to earn and deserve God's love, and it's up to me to continue maintaining it. I know well enough to not think that, but as I have been confronted with, as she put it, a situation that I can't manage my way out of, 
or as she puts it a little bit later in that talk, as I'm stumbling around in the debris of dreams I thought I was entitled to, and plans I didn't realize I had made, I've realized that sometimes my best, my best efforts, my best intentions, my best is insufficient to the situation. And so as I look down at a future that I don't want, and as I am having to recognize and reckon with my own frailty and my own failure, I'm being challenged to believe the gospel as if for the first time. To believe that God loves this version of me as well. To believe that it's not when we think we have it all together, that God is for us, but when everything is clearly falling apart. To believe that Jesus really did enter into this darkness on the cross, not just any darkness or darkness in general, but that he took upon himself this sorrow, my sorrow, at relational loss. That he took upon himself this weakness, my weakness, and my inability to solve this. This shame that comes with failure, my shame and my failure, this sad result of my divorce, to believe that he has taken all of that upon himself. One of the questions that's stuck in my mind was one asked to me by a therapist in one of the darkest moments of this season. She looked at me and she said, Andy, how can this be for you? And I thought it was such a stupid question. And it really made me mad. And I still don't know if it's a good question, but it stuck in my head, and I've been asking it of myself every now and then. And one night I was, I was in my backyard late at night, and I was looking up at the stars, and I decided I would pose this question to God. God, how can this be for me? And a phrase came back to me, almost immediately. It was unspoken, unbidden, and unexpected. When I asked God, how can this be for me? The first phrase that entered my mind was, I am for you. I am for you. So there might not be anything for me. Not, might not be anything redeeming about divorce. Maybe there's no great lesson or insight that I couldn't have learned some other way. Right now, I don't like the idea that this is some stepping stone in my maturity or some blessing in disguise or God's discipline. It's just bad and it just hurts. And right now, I don't know if there's anything in it for me. But even there, especially there, God is for me. And if God is for me, then the Bible tells me that nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me. The Greek word here is the same word they used for divorce. Nothing will be able to divorce us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is for us. That is what I have to hope in in this situation, and it is the hope I have to offer to you. So I encourage you to watch Kate Bowler's whole talk with tissues. We'll post it to Facebook. And it won't ruin it to tell you how she ends it, because she ends it by saying what I want to end by saying. She says this. Life will break your heart. 
And life may take everything you have and everything you hope for. But there is one kind of prosperity gospel that I believe in. I believe that in the, in the darkness, even there, there will be beauty and there will be love. And every now and then, it will feel like more than enough. Let's pray.